You speak Spanish? What are you? I'm sorry, but you don't look Latina at all. Are you black, black? These are just some of the offensive and unsolicited comments that I've heard in life as an Afro-Latina in the US. Because like Dorancia abunda, ignorance is abundant. And some folks rather live their lives in blissful ignorance than take five minutes to Google and read about the transatlantic slave trade. You know, the one where millions of Africans were captured and taken from their lands for over 400 years. That one. Well, if you Google, transatlantic slave trade, you'll see that the Encyclopedia Britannica will tell you a detailed history. And one of the first stops on that slave trade was the island where I'm from, República Dominicana. You see, I was born in San Pedro de Macorís, a coastal town in the DR where people flood the malecón on Sundays and sit seaside to drink presidentes and eat chimichurris and listen to and dance to merengue, bachata, and dembo. Sounds like a good time, right? Well, San Pedro also has a complicated racial history. Here's the breakdown. There's a large population of English-speaking immigrants from the Lesser Antio Islands in San Pedro. They call them cocolos, and they came looking for work during the sugar cane industry boom in the Dominican Republic, and they stayed. They made San Pedro their home, they, their culture became ingrained in our own. And um, we eat foods like janiqueques, my sister's favorite, domplines con bacalao, and drink like guava veri. We also have the guloyas, a folkloric dance group that dances during our local festivals. If you ask someone from San Pedro what San Pedro is mostly known for, they'd probably say baseball. You know why? because there's an unspoken shame in San Pedro for being associated with cocolos, with the cocolo culture, as it means acknowledging your own blackness. And um, in many places in the DR, all over DR, and in San Pedro, there are certain things that we do to identify ourselves more with the European lineage than with our African lineage. For instance, women make it their job to have bone straight hair during 80 plus degree weather. And they also make it um, their job to stay out of the sun so as not to get a shade darker. But lately, there's been a movement to embrace our own blackness and rock our natural hair textures. Um, however, that wasn't always the case. As a little girl, um, I used to be called Indiacita, which on its face is a term of endearment. And um, it literally means little Indian. So it confused the heck out of me because at the same time, I was learning that Taino Indians had been long gone for centuries. So how was I a little Indian? Um, there were also terms to refer to my hair like pelo malo, bad hair, as opposed to good hair, which meant really more European-like hair. And as you can imagine, these kinds of words and language um, can lead to, unfortunately, seep into a young uh, child's psyche and not just confuse them about who they are, but make them ashamed of it. Um, in an interview with NPR, Frances Robles, um, a reporter for the Miami Herald, interviewed black people in the Dominican Republic for a story she was writing. And she asked them what, whether they believed they were black. And they said they didn't. They did not believe they were black. And some of them surprisingly said they only found out they were black when they came to the United States. Um, but wait, there's more. Um, DR also had a major influence from a racist dictator. For over 20 years, Leonidas Trujillo ruled the, the Dominican Republic, and he had a strong anti-Haitianism policy and anti-blackness. He even killed thousands of Haitians during the Parsley Massacre. Dude even tried to cover it up. But it, it was later learned that he truly was trying to cleanse the island of its own blackness. And at the same time, he had a flexible immigration policy for people of European descent. Our history is exhausting, y'all. But in many ways, San Pedro is a microcosm of other Latin American countries where my fellow Afro-Latinos are suffering from the same things, from racism, 
from social injustice, and they're still fighting for their rights. It's no secret that Latinos can also be racist against each other. Um, there's no question that something called mejorar la raza, or improve the race, is still a thing. It basically means marrying someone of lighter skin so that your children could be of lighter skin as well. There's no question that both in the US and in America, I'm sorry, and in Latin America, the lighter your skin color, the easier for you to pass as white, have better opportunities in life, and be treated equally. Why? Because the general rules of colorism and racism still apply, no matter where we go. I mean, many of you remember that brown bag test that was used um, amongst African Americans in the 20th century. The test was basically that you um, compare a brown bag to someone's complexion, and that if the person was darker than the brown bag, they were not allowed in so, uh, certain social settings. And Henry Louis Gates, a Harvard professor, described the test as internalized racist notion that light skin is a marker of intellectual, cultural, social, and personal superiority over and above darker people. Well, as Afro-Latinos, we are marginalized based both on our skin color and our ethnicity. More recently in the US, you witnessed the uprising and strength of the Black Lives Matter movement. Similarly, last summer in Colombia, black and indigenous groups erupted in protests against police violence, racism, and other civil rights abuses. And in Mexico, 2.5 Afro-Mexicans were finally included in the 2020 census. There are similar stories all over Latin America. And in the US, during and after the Floyd protests last summer, Latinos were faced to look in the mirror to face their own anti-blackness and colorism. Now, at times it feels like we forget we're also subject of similar levels of racism, and we need to do more. Now, after migrating to the United States with my family, we settled in Union City, New Jersey, which should really be renamed Little Latin America. If you know, you know. I mean, walking on Berglain Avenue felt like taking a stroll through the Caribbean, Central, and South America. Union City was a safe place to land, and it became my second home. And because of that, attending a predominantly white university was an even greater culture shock. In college, I oftentimes was the only Latina and black student in some of my classes. And I quickly realized that no, no, it could definitely get worse when I started law school. Law school proved to be even more racist and elitist than college was. During my second summer in law school, I worked for the IT department. Um, and my boss sent me to hook up a computer for a new professor. As I was walking towards the white male professor's um, office, he stopped me at the door and told me he didn't need any cleaning at the time. Um, I was gutted, but I quickly and res politely responded to him that I was there to assist with his computer and that I was a third year law student. I also told him I'd send someone else. I'll never forget how red his face got. He was embarrassed, but he wasn't embarrassed enough to apologize or to be ashamed. I think he was more embarrassed that he was exposed. Now, there are many similar stories that happened in law school, too many to recount here. Don't get me wrong, I'm proud to be the first lawyer in my family. <laughs> I mean, NBC News says that I'm one of less than 2% of Latina lawyers in the US, which is a TED talk for another day. Um, but I'm proud, nevertheless, and it's been hard. It came at a price. I graduated law school over 10 years ago, and I've been in, uh, in my profession over, for over 10 years as an attorney. But there are days that I feel like I don't belong. Oftentimes, I not only had to do my job, but I had to work harder than my white counterparts. I've been questioned on everything from whether I'm truly an attorney, whether I'm worthy of my salary, whether my oral advocacy skills were good enough 
because Spanish is my first language. I recall a colleague told my, one of my old bosses that I didn't belong in the courtroom, that I should stick to writing briefs. Guess what? I argued before the Supreme Court of New Jersey this year two times. <laughs> Although existing as a Dominicana and Afro-Latina in the United States is not rare, and our identity is ever more present today because of social media, sports, the creative arts, Hollywood, it doesn't change how we're treated in our everyday lives. In fact, a Pew study says that 57% of Latinos in the US believe that their lives are affected by the skin color. This isn't just my story. This is the story of millions of Afro-Latinos around the world. And according to Pew, 12 to 15 million Afro-Latinos in the US. There's no question we exist. It's simple, really. Our race is black, our ethnicity is Latino. Some of us speak Spanish when we get mad or lose our temper, or Spanglish, or Portuguese or French Creole. Heck, some of our Latinos just speak English when they're mad. Some of us eat rice and beans like it's our religion, or arepas or platanos. Some of us prefer a good burger. Some of us listen to Aventura when, after our breakup, and some of us just listen to Mariah or Adele. You get the drift. The thing is, African Americans and Afro Latinos are some of the most talented, multifaceted, resilient people that I know. Our rich culture, our music, our traditions, our beautiful skin, our bodies are the subject of intrigue, admiration, and imitation. But it is not our jobs to educate people about who we are. It is 2021. I shouldn't have to explain why my hair is one texture this week and another next week. You have search engines, Google, smartphones. Enlighten yourselves. Learn about hair textures from 1A to 4C. We already have to deal with these stereotypes that are assigned to us for being black and being Latino. So the burden is now on you. Do the work. Get educated. It is a new day. By now, we know that there are implicit biases. That racism is not often blatant, but most recently, we've learned that people have been emboldened to make their racist ways known. And if they don't want to learn about people who are different than them, then that's OK. But don't get in the way of those who still want to evolve. I challenge you today. Think about how you treat others in your everyday lives who are different than you. I implore you, take a few minutes, a few seconds even, pause before you speak, before you judge, before you act. Do the work. Ask yourselves, do I truly feel this way at my very core? Or is this a product of my environment? Was I conditioned to think this way? Am I making assumptions or stereotypes? before getting to know someone? Are these truly my own thoughts? Or are these thoughts that have been reinforced by my upbringing or my environment? Dig deeper. Truly educate yourselves about other cultures, races, and ethnicities. But don't just educate yourselves. Educate your children and your children's children. And maybe the seeds of that knowledge that you plant today will multiply and grow for centuries to come. Maybe we can truly leave this world a better place. Thank you.